We should also maybe decide if we agree on something. That We're going to agree good. on many things, I, I suppose. And a lot, of, a lot of a discussion like this is often terminological, and it's partly going to be the case between John and I, because his intellectual background is different than mine, although it overlaps in some important ways. And so partly what I'm hoping to do with the discussion tonight is to make sure that we actually understand each other. This is definitely not a debate in which one of us is going to win. What, what we're hoping to do is to have the kind of conversation that allows for the scaffolding and the further development of ideas, Agreed. which is really what an intellectual conversation is. So I, I want to offer you a couple of propositions and tell me what you think about them. Sure. I mean, the first thing is that I don't believe that the question, does life have meaning, is actually a reasonable question. I don't think it's properly formulated. And the reason I believe that is because that isn't really what people are want, want to know when they ask that question. No. I mean, life has lots of meanings, right? The Buddhists would say that life is suffering. And, you know, we might not think about suffering as meaning, but fundamentally it's anxiety and pain and with some disgust thrown in there maybe for good measure. <laughs> and, and those are meanings. And even if you're nihilistic and you're, you're not oriented towards a belief in some sort of ultimate meaning structure, that doesn't mean you can escape from the meaning of life. What it does mean is that the meaning of your life is misery, suffering, anxiety, and a real decrement in quality. So we're, we're, we're trapped inside the question of the meaning of life. There's no getting outside of it. You can say there's no ultimate meaning, but then you have to define ultimate. So, and then the, the other thing that I thought... So let me just make sure yeah. I got the first proposition. Yeah, okay. Uh, the first proposition is you, the question, I want to make sure I got your wording right, does life have a meaning is ill-posed. Do you yes. want me to, I just want to store that, I can either respond or wait till you put your second question out. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, um, I'm just want, I just don't want to lose the first question. Well, the, the other thing second. that might be useful clarifying, I mean, I understand what you mean by relevance realization. I, ter I have a formulation of it in my own, yeah. in my own language, but um, so I'm going to make a couple of comments on that as well, and you can tell me if, sure. if you agree or disagree on that. So one of the things that's quite, one of the ways that you can approach the idea of meaning is by making a separate assumption about what the fundamental structures in the world are. I mean, materialists and empiricists tend to believe that the fundamental structures are, we'll say, atomic particles, even though we know we can go higher resolution than that. There's atomic particles and there's the space in which they're distributed. And what that means is that the combination of quantum particles, quantized particles, plus space, allows for the array of physical entities in patterns, right? Like music is a pattern. And it's, it's, there seems to me that there's something profoundly similar about patterns and information. And it seems to me that what we experience as meaning is something like our interaction with information. Now, I just want to say one more thing about that. The problem with information in some sense is that there's too much of it. Yes. And so one of the things you could say about life's meaning is that there's absolutely way too much of it. You know, and you, you can certainly experience that if you ever have an experience of awe or even of, of, of overwhelming absurdity. Those are both quasi-religious experiences. So relevance realization is actually as far as I can tell, it's the limitation of what's essentially a in close to infinite field of information that's so rich that it can't be exhausted into a narrower form that's focal and useful for this particular time in this particular place for this particular set of activities. Right. So it's a narrowing process. Is that yeah, okay, so uh, I'll respond to the second thing first because that will actually help me to respond to your, your first question about the posing of the question. Yeah, I think that's a good way of putting it. Um, and that, although I would want to emphasize that I don't think that process is just a selection process, it's, it's an important transformation process. Um, because uh, we do something to the information, and, and you, were ref you, you made reference to this in the embodiment. It's not just that we have sort of passively taken in the information or selected it from the environment. We, we, it's not, we make the pieces, like you say, we find patterns. It's how the pieces are relevant to each other, how they're relevant to us. Again, and I'm trying to emphasize this, not just as some so, sort of cold calculation about that information, right. but in a way in which, I mean, we, we say it like we make sense. It's, it's, a, it's constitutive of our, of our cognitive agency. Just like our bodies uh, take in matter, but they don't just select the matter, they transform it and restructure it so we have the ability to operate in the world. Our minds don't just select the information, they take in it, they transform it and structure mm -hmm. it so analogous to our bodies, we gain skills and abilities to interact with that world from which that information 
was that's what that's why I think people love to watch bands improvise because really what they're doing if they're really especially if they're doing it collectively is they're engaging in a collective process of the spontaneous transmutation of patterns and I think the reason that people find that so deeply meaningful is because it is uh, representation like an ongoing abstract artistic representation I think it's, a, of, it's an exemplification yes of, of the, what we do in the world that's right I think one of the reasons why we like art is we play with the variance well we were, we're playing in the in the in the Piagetian sense of playing, in the sense of developing our skills, we play with the relevance realization machinery for its own sake. Mm -hmm. But that allows me to go back to your, I think asking, you know, for the meaning of life, uh, it carries with it sort of, pre like even saying the meaning in life, uh, mm -hmm. it carries with it the presupposition that meaning is, uh, is sort of there uh, to be found, and it, it immediately steers us away from this ongoing process, right, in which we're taking in information, uh, transforming it, uh, structuring it, altering ourselves, fitting to a world that is then also, so also itself restructuring itself, changing itself, and so there's this ongoing evolving relationship. So one of the reasons why I don't like the question, the meaning of life, is it proposes a ready-made answer to be found. It, 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 it presupposes a static thing to be discovered, or even a static relation to be realized. And, and it also carries with it the idea that um, there, it, it's like like you said, it, it's like there is um, a, an answer to a question that has been posed. When I don't think the issue facing us is a riddle or a question in that sense to, if, that some proposition will satisfy. I don't think there's anything that, I'm sorry, this will sound incredibly pretentious, but I'm being asked about I think. I don't think there's anything. <laughs> I'm it, trying to make him sound pretentious. Right. I, don't, I don't think there's a proposition that anybody can say to you that will render your life meaningful. I mean, you might do things with that proposition that might mm -hmm. uh, fit you better to the world so that horror becomes less prevalent and flourishing becomes more prominent. Mm -hmm. But I don't, uh, to think that the answer is in the proposition is to misunderstand the role of propositions in our cognition. The propositional level is very high up and sits on many recursive levels of relevance realization that only at their very tip produce this kind of propositional processing. The meaning is much more our knowing how to interact with the world, knowing how, look, knowing how to fit my hand to this glass is part of that process. And that's not based on sort of just, it, it's not primarily based on my beliefs about the glass, it's based on much more complex dynamical system by which my body, my perception, the glass, the atmosphere are fitting together so that I can grasp the glass. So, well, one of the things that, that I found interesting, I learned this, I think, mostly from uh, Gibson, who wrote a book called... Right. Eco yeah, you know the, the Ecological book. Pro Approach to Visual yeah, Perception. Yeah. So, yeah. one of the things Gibson presupposes, it's a, it's a very interesting... He has a very interesting way of looking at the world, and, and it's, it's tied deeply into our fundamental presuppositions about the structure of reality, because... One of the big issues about meaning, in some sense, is whether it's fundamentally constituent, cons, cons, constitutive of reality, or if it's a, what would you call an emergent property of something more fundamental. Now, the answer to that question, in part, is exactly what do you mean by reality? And it also, the question is also, what do you mean by truth? And these aren't, mm. this isn't Pontius Pilate's question, it's a whole different kind of question. Right. Now, the, the, the modern neuroscientists, in some sense following Gibson, make the claim that when you look at a glass like that, that what happens in your brain is that the pattern of the glass maps itself onto the pattern of your gripping hand, and that maps itself onto the pattern of pouring and, and drinking. And that a lot of that happens before, potentially, before or alongside your conscious perception of the glass as an object. Mm -hmm. So we know, for example, that are, there are people who claim to be blind who can still map objects onto their body. So, okay, so that's called blind sight. So, when, so developing that idea, it, it's appeared to me that there's good evidence that what we see when we look at the world is meaning. We don't see objects and infer meaning. We see meaning and we infer objects. And, and so then the question is, well, is the meaning real? And then the answer to that is, well, what do you mean by real? And, and I'll, it'll only take me a minute to lay this out. Okay. This starts to depend on whether you're a Darwinian or a Newtonian. If you're a Newtonian, then the real thing is the material object. But if, and we also know that Newton in some important ways was wrong. But if you're a Darwinian, 
And you almost have to be a Darwinian. I, I really don't see any escape from it, unless you don't know what you're talking about fundamentally. <laughs> um, there's reasons for that, is that the thing that, de the, thing, the thing that determines whether or not you're going to survive and propagate, which is, by the way, the best solution you can possibly answer to the problem of life if you're a biological organism and you have a Darwinian philosophy, the question you're trying to answer is, what is the appropriate meaning to perceive in each environment? Because that determines your action, and your action, the consequences of your action, determines whether you, know, you survive and propagate. And so if you take the question of meaning from a Darwinian perspective, you can actually say, as far as I can tell, that the fundamental constituent elements, at least of experience and perhaps of reality itself, are the meanings that you perceive before you infer the object. Now, you know, that's a pretty radical ontological claim, and I've never heard anyone else actually make it, except for maybe the pragmatists. It's a pragmatic, it's a variant of pragmatic philosophy, but I've tried to wrap my head around that argument and see if I can destroy it, but I can't. So I'm, I'm just wondering if, you know, what you think about that. I have a lot to think about that, and a lot to say about it. Uh, first of all, um, let, before I, I get into the Darwinian, um, Newtonian thing, which I've seen you do a couple times before, and I've always found it very interesting. It's one of my little tricks. It, it's one of your... <laughs> you, you belittle it. It's one of your good tricks. I mean, it's a very good one. It's a very good point. Um, first of all, the question... I, I do think that that fittedness to the world does create... I think Plato had a fantastic insight that above, any, above and beyond any particular desire we have, we have a desire for what we desire to be real in some sense. One of the ways to rob meaning from your life is to suddenly realize that a bunch of things, a bunch of the things you've desired or the bunch of the things that you thought made you happy are illusory in some sense. In fact, people will do a bizarre thing, and I do this every time in uh, a class. I'll, I'll ask, how many of you are in, you know, uh, really satisfying, deeply satisfying personal relationships? Um, and surprisingly, many people put up their hands. Um, um, <laughs> Those are the self-deceptive ones. <laughs> And then, and, and then I, <laughs> yeah. and then, and then I do the following. I say, how many would, you, how many of you would want to know if your partner was cheating on you, such that it would destroy the relationship? And almost all of them put their hands back up again. Name, name, name. So they would rather have the truth than have all of that other stuff that they find so good be illusory. And I think that was one of Plato's profound insights. This connectedness to reality is a fundamental drive in us. Now, you know, John, when you're asking that, you're basically asking people whether or not if they were in a perfect garden, they'd be willing to check out the snake. Yes, right. Yeah. And, I, I, and I, the I, answer, of course, we all know is that, well, of course, people will check out the snake, snake. because that's just what we're like. And, and I think, but I do think there's something important to that. I think ultimately, uh, you know, the platonic orientation towards truth is grounded in that notion of a deeper drive towards real. I think asking the question about whether or not meaning is real, um, Part of it, I, I want to challenge the presupposition behind the question first, because the presupposition behind that are on, is that only things are real and that relationships, relations between things aren't real. And I think it is very, re it, so it might strike people as odd for me to say, yes, of course, I think uh, relevance is real. I don't think it's part, and this is where I might differ with you, but I think we'll have to negotiate it. I don't think it's part of the physical uh, fabric of the universe. Uh, nor do I think it is it just a subjective illusion on our head. It is a real relation uh, between us and the environment, just like evolution is a real relation okay. between an organism and its environment. Okay. It's not a property okay. of the so, environment. It's not a property of the organism. It's a real relation between them that explains the, both the history of the organism and the history of the environment. Okay, so that would be a lovely thing to see if we can get clear, because that's, that's a very profound argument, like a profound uh, debate. Sure. You know, there, there are Heideggerians who took opposite positions on that. Yes, I'm argument. aware of that. And yeah. So, and some of them were psychologists, right? And mm -hmm. so I'm just going to outline it for the audience and to make sure we're thinking about it the same way. One stance is that um, meaning, so to speak, is a consequence of the operation of these elaborate patterns of construction in your mind and that you're imposing that on the world. Right. So it's that's, like a structure issue. Yeah, that's a romantic issue yeah, of meaning. Yeah. yeah, and then the other one is that, no, no, meaning is, is in the world, so to speak, and that what you do with the structures in your head is limit it and narrow it. Mm. And I think some, in some weird way both of those things are true. But, but here's something that, that I, I've been thinking about for a long time and, and I want you to maybe help me 
figure out a bit more. So I'm going to go at this from two perspectives. So uh, back in the late 1800s, Nietzsche basically formalized a set of observations about what he thought was happening in Western society and the then the world at large, right? right? And the basic argument was something like this, was that the metaphysical presuppositions of religious systems and the metaphysical presuppositions of scientific systems were not in sync. They, were, they, were, they weren't of the same paradigm. And that as Western scientific investigation had proceeded, it became, it became obvious that either the truths of religion weren't true, or at least that they weren't of the type that science recognized as truth. And Nietzsche basically described that as the death of God. And so he said that three things would happen in the aftermath of that. Um, he was a prophet, you know, he was like an Old Testament prophet. Um, he said that totalitarianism would become unbelievably attractive to people, especially in its hyper-socialist variants like communism, and that millions of people would die in the 20th century as a consequence of that, and that it would be a necessary battle. And he said that like 40 years before the Russian Revolution, and so like, yeah, go Nietzsche. He's like, you try to predict the future like five years ahead, see how far you get. And then the other thing he said would, that, would be that nihilism would rise to, to, to uh, pathological proportions because it's basically the polar opposite of totalitarianism, right? You wipe out the religious structures, people move towards ideology to reattain that certainty, but it's rigid and, mm -hmm. and, and deadly, or they fall off into chaos itself. Okay, then Nietzsche made one more proposition, which was that the only solution to that would be for human beings to transform themselves into meaning-creating creatures. And so what Nietzsche basically did, and I think this was a mistake in his metaphysics, was that he assumed that the objective description of reality was correct, that reality in and of itself was dead and meaningless, but that human beings could interact with that in such a way as a consequence of their individual choices to make that richly meaningful, and that we needed to do that because the alternatives would be nihilism or totalitarianism. One more sure. comment on that. So, you know, Jung was a student of Nietzsche's, a, a profound student, and he was actually trying to solve the problem that Nietzsche put forward, which was, oh, wow, well, we got nihilism on the one hand, and we got totalitarianism on the other hand, and, you know, those don't really seem to be very good solutions, since millions of people die because of one, and millions of people commit suicide because of the other. It's like, those are suboptimal solutions, in all likelihood. So, but, but Jung, in some sense, took issue with Nietzsche's fundamental proposition, which was that human beings were meaning creating creatures. And I actually think it's the most profound critique of Nietzsche because, because what Jung pointed out, and this is something that just blew me away when I first understood it, and it has to do with your relevance realization issue in, in a deadly way. It's like, imagine the things that attract your attention and your interest. Well, okay, so then you might think, well, is that a voluntary process or an involuntary process? And to answer that, you can think about it. It's like you're, you're working on some dismally wretched, boring, and stultifying thing at work or as a student, and your, your attention is like fragmented everywhere. You think about the dust bunnies under your bed and that maybe the dishes need to be done and the dog needs to be walked and the, you know, the rug needs to be vacuumed and it's like bloody well anything other than that boring task even though you know you have to do it in order to, say, pass a course or pass an exam or get the assignment done, you can't control your damn brain. It's wandering everywhere. You know, and then, so, so the weird thing about that is that you cannot voluntarily control your relevance realization. And then you have the contrary problem, which is that, you know, there's a YouTube video about kittens and it's like, bang, man, you're focused on that, <laughs> you know. And so one of the things you might ask, is just who the hell is in control of this relevance realization? And that was Jung's question. It was like, well, where Nietzsche fell apart, Nietzsche fell apart, was that he assumed that human beings were primarily meaning-making creatures. But then if you try it, you know, it's like, hey, I'm going to find it really meaningful to go to the gym three times a week next week for half an hour, and I'm going to push myself right to my limits. It's like I have every reason for doing it. I know why I should do it, but I'd rather sit on the couch, you know, in my underwear and eat cheaties. Cheetos. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, 
So you've got to ask yourself, man, who's in charge? And one of the things that the psychodynamic theorists were so damn good at was pointing out that, well, you think it's you, but it's not. And so then that begs the question. It's like, where's the meaning coming from? And who is in charge? And so I know that's questions that you're trying to answer, but it doesn't exactly seem to me that we're overlaying that on the world or that if we are, we, we don't have much voluntary control over that. Okay, well, um, I don't think we're overlaying it on the world, and I, that's what I meant by a real relation, and I was comparing it to evolution. I, I think uh, to talk about us being meaning makers in the Nietzschean sense is to fall prey to uh, the romantic illusion uh, that the world is a blank slate. I mean, you, you mm -hmm. have the blank slate of the Enlightenment in which, you know, reason the world writes on us, and then you have the blank slate of the romantics in which the world is a blank slate, like the painted, the unpainted canvas that we, and that mm -hmm. Nietzsche mm -hmm. constantly used the artistic metaphor. And he even created the idea of a lifestyle as if our lives are works of art because the world is just an empty canvas mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. upon which we project right. our meaning. Well, and there's totalitarian presuppositions in there too because one of the presuppositions of totalitarian ideologues is that there is no such thing as human nature and that people can be constructed in any way possible. Exactly, and that's why existentialism comes out of Nietzsche because ex existentialism posits that our essence and our nature is completely of the property of our own self-definition. So what I'm, what I'm actually doing is I'm rejecting both of those blank slates. I'm saying the world is neither a blank slate that we romantically project upon, nor is the mind a blank slate that, ex that experience just empirically draws upon. What I'm, my, what I'm proposing is in, instead is a dynamic interaction between the two. And to say that, you know, uh, who's in charge is, 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 kind of an, is kind of an odd question, but I, before I, I, I answer that, I want to take a little bit of exception on your inter interpretation of Nietzsche, um, because I think uh, it might help, um, and it also might get us back to the, the Newton-Darwin thing, which I promised to get back to, too. I mean, Nietzsche lays, and I, I mean, and again, uh, uh, Heidegger followed up on this, he actually lays the, the, the history of nihilism much further back, right? He says that the, the history of nihilism starts with Plato, and, uh, and that Christianity is just Plato for the masses. Because my interpretation of Nietzsche is that the main cause of nihilism was, goes back to like the Axel Revolution. It's the creation of the, du the two world model. And, and the idea is that this world gets its meaning Right, its value, it has an instrumental value in getting us to some other world, to some world in which we will finally find the fulfillment and the protection from horror that we don't find in this world. So a heaven and, right? Mm -hmm. And then what happens, right, the way, in, the way in, it wasn't just the clash between the scientific and the, world, uh, the religious worldview. What happens is that the scientific worldview calls the second world, the heavenly world, into question. But, What's happened is we have millennia of Christianity and Platonism tutoring us to believe that this world is not meaningful in itself because yeah. it's only valuable insofar as we get to this heaven. And then once science says, ah, imagine that there is no heaven, or all we're John left, Lennon. or John Lennon, yeah. right? Yeah. Then we're left, <laughs> my favorite Beatle, we're left, right? That, that really dates me, doesn't it? Uh, uh, that, then we're left with this world that we've been tutored for millennia has no, has no value in it. And so I think that what Nietzsche was trying to do, I, I agree with you, there's a romantic streak in Nietzsche, and like I said, I reject that romantic streak that the world is a blank slate upon which we paint mm -hmm. our lifestyles. Mm -hmm. uh, that is ridiculously hubristic in nature. Um, but there was another thing Nietzsche was trying to do, and so I think there's, I mean, Nietzsche has multiple voices in yes, his anything. Yes, yes, yes. So in addition to the romantic project, which I often find really bombastic, there is another project that he called trying to revalue the earth, which was to try to see the earth as a place in which we could be at home in its, on its own terms, for its own sake, hmm. that we could so find... That was more Heidegger, I think. No, no, no think? Heidegger talked... Nietzsche talks about revaluing, learning how to revalue the earth and loving the earth as a repeated theme throughout Nietzsche's work. And loving the body is a repeated mm -hmm. theme in Nietzsche's work. And to, because he thought that just like we had the two worlds, we had the two parts of us. We had the body, but the body only existed in service of the soul. And the body, yeah. therefore, has no in, 
in, inherent value because mm -hmm. its only job is to get the soul to the only place where it has real meaning, which is heaven. Mm -hmm. And then his point was, if we lose the heaven and if we lose the idea of the soul, we have to get back to revaluing the body, mm -hmm. revaluing the earth. And what I'm proposing in this sort of evolutionary model of relevance realization is exactly that the body and the earth co-create this real relation that fundamentally homes us and fits us into the world. And that the meaning crisis, and therefore, it, it's not just, I mean, yes, I agree, there are definitely historical uh, forces for it, and the rise of science, and the, and the demise of the, of the wisdom traditions and the religious traditions. Mm -hmm. But I think the meaning crisis is, is, is in some sense also a perennial problem. You see it cross-culturally, you see it cross-historically. Because people can always get trapped between these two kinds of perspectives they can have on themselves. They can always fall prey to these kinds of two world models. And so I think the, 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 the thing I want to say is um, part of what's going on right now in the meaning crisis in the West is we're trying to, and this is the way Nietzsche, I think, was prescient, as you said. He was, he was a prophet. Uh, by the way, he predicted four things. He predicted that he would be famous eventually. Mm -hmm. um, um, Although that he would basically starve to death in the meantime. Right, but he, yes. you know, why I am so great was yeah. one of his... Timing points. is everything. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. Um, and, and so um, uh, what he was prescient about is the fact that, I mean, basically since the actual age in 800 you know, BCE and onward, we've had this two-world model. And now we're going through a, a radical re-embedding. For a lot of people, that's caused a, ca a kind of nihilism. But one of the things I would throw out to you is that there's a possibility in, a, in an emerging cognitive science, and a cognitive science in which embodiment and embeddedment are becoming central, for appropriating that re-embedding process a, as a way of discovering, rediscovering, um, how we can be at home, fundamentally at home in the world, and how the earth and our bodies co-create that home in a way that, again, protects us from horror and allows us to flourish as cognitive okay. agents. Okay, so you, you did something I think is lovely, and, and I don't think that it's people who aren't quite deeply educated can do, is you pushed the problem quite a bit farther back in time. So I want to one-up you on that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I do think it's a deeper problem than, than, than Nietzsche pointed out. He pointed out the, the more articulated modern end of it, you know, and yeah. we see that as the conflict, say, between science and religion. But if you, you can push these sorts of things back, I think, to the dawn of self-consciousness itself, 